was incredible, but also on onshore wind and also you see the concentrating solar power and the offshore wind decrease in cost. Today, we are at the good sites with the good resources for wind uh, on land and uh, solar PV uh, around one or two dollar cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, that's only at the good solar and wind resource sites, of course. But also on average, you see that we are now below the electricity cost of the lowest fossil fuel uh, cost range uh, that, uh, that, you, that you see over here in that uh, gray uh, area. And for comparison, we have just seen in uh, Saudi Arabia in April the announcement of a tender that has won uh, by Aqua Power. They built a 700 megawatt solar farm for a price of 1.04 uh, US dollar cents per kilowatt hour. So below the 1 euro cents per kilowatt hour. It's incredible. We have never expected that that could be so low in such a, a short time frame. But also for wind, we see two uh, cents per kilowatt hour in Spain in recent tenders, et cetera, et cetera. That's, you could say, the good news. But the problem is, of course, that these low cost renewable electricity production is only at these places where you have the good solar and wind resources. And here you see the solar resource map and the wind speed map at 100 meters. And when you have a careful look to these uh, maps, then you see especially solar we have the highest irradiation and resources, you could say, in the desert areas, the red areas on these maps. Um, and when you look to the wind speed map, it is not an offshore wind speed map, as you see, but offshore winds are the, the highest, but also at certain areas on land, uh, in Patagonia, for example, Argentina, but also in the desert areas we have, uh, and in coastal areas, we have very high wind speeds uh, too where we have, of course, also the highest production with, uh, with our wind turbine. So good news is we have a very low cost, but it's only at these sites where we have the, the highest irradiation or the highest wind speeds. And when you see these sites, it is mostly remote sites far from the demand that we have. And therefore, uh, we, we have an, an issue to solve also. How do we transport that cost, that, that energy uh, from these good uh, renewable uh, resource sites to the demand areas? But first of all, we don't have a problem uh, in uh, producing sufficient amounts of renewable energy uh, around the world. If you look to the total amount uh, of energy that we consume worldwide, that is that 556 exajoule, that is 10 to the power of 18, which is the equivalent, uh, the same as 155,000 billion kilowatt hours. That's for all the energy. That's not only for electricity, which is, uh, by the way, less than 20% of our total energy consumption, but it is for mobility, it is for heating, it is for the, our industry, for, uh, for feedstock, etc. All this energy, if we... Uh, put on 10% of the surface of Australia uh, solar panels, then we produce all this energy for the whole world. Uh, but we can do it also with wind. If we use 1.5% of the Pacific Ocean and we place every kilometer a large wind turbine, then we produce also all this energy for the whole world. So space is not an issue, but of course, worldwide it is not an issue, but, but of course, in certain areas, it is an issue. Do we have enough space to produce the energy uh, locally? Um, when you look to these numbers, then also, uh, and we want to produce it, for example, in the uh, in the Sahara Desert, then you see we only need 8% of Sahara Desert area, because the Sahara Desert is uh, bigger than Australia. But there you see also the, 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 the strange situation is, of course, that the or not strange, but the Sahara Desert is also two times as big as the total uh, uh, area of all the European Union countries together. So there is much more space, but that is at remote places where we have also the good resources. And now we want to see how can we bring this cheap renewable uh, electricity to the right places, to the demand at the right time also. 
Um, and therefore, the conversion from electricity, uh, putting into water and splitting the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen, uh, uh, gives a an, uh, uh, an, an reason that we can transport that energy more cheaply than electricity and also store it more cheaply than electricity uh, when we convert. So we have losses. We need to invest, of course, in an electrolyzer, but then transport costs are in general, and we'll come to that, a factor of 10 lower than when we transport the, the same amount of uh, energy by electricity. And in general, the storage costs are a factor of 100 or, or more lower than when we uh, store hydrogen instead of electricity uh, in, in, for example, pumped hydro or in, in batteries. So that's the reason that you want to convert electricity into hydrogen. For transporting uh, to deliver cheap solar and wind energy cost effectively at the right time and place, but also to decarbonize these sectors where uh, electricity is not di directly the, the right way to do. For example, when we use feedstock, uh, there's uh, energy as a feedstock to make chemicals, for example, there you can't use electricity. You need to use, of course, hydrogen and carbon to produce these chemicals. But also for mobility and heating, balancing the electricity system, there you see that hydrogen will play a role. And in fact, if you look to this system aspects, then in the end, you will have cost competition by imported indirect renewable electricity via hydrogen with locally produced electricity and hydrogen uh, from your solar and wind uh, at these sites where you uh, uh, can, can produce them. And that is the same, uh, same systemic thing that we have today. We compete in price uh, via imported or uh, uh, own uh, uh, or production in our own country, for example, with natural gas or whatever. And that will be the situation also in the future in a renewable energy system. You will have local production, but the prices will compete with produced uh, uh, electricity elsewhere, imported uh, uh, or transported by, uh, by hydrogen in this case. Now, let me explain <coughs> what, what hydrogen is. And, and how you uh, can, can use it. And let me start by this, this graph first. How do you produce hydrogen? Uh, hydrogen is not an energy source, as some people think. It is an energy carrier, like electricity. And you have to produce uh, hydrogen from an energy source. And that can be the fossil fuels, but it can be also uh, electricity or even sunlight or biomass materials, biogenic waste streams. And what you see here is all kinds of technologies, what the output molecules are, and uh, they give it a color. And the color is uh, reflecting more or less the amount of CO2 emissions that you have over there. Of course, green uh, is uh, without any CO2 emissions, but you see here the colors of gray and blue. Now, gray is when you produce it from a fossil fuel resource, whereby you produce carbon dioxide uh, and that is released to the air, then you call it gray or brown or black. Um, blue is when you capture part of these uh, CO2 emissions and store them into the, uh, an empty uh, gas field, for example, or an aquifer. And you see green and some uh, uh, when it is, of course, uh, without any uh, CO2 emissions to the air. Um, when you produce uh, hydrogen from water by using electricity, it's not uh, directly green. It is only green when you use, of course, renewable uh, resources like solar and wind or hydropower, etc. But if you use, for example, electricity from a uh, coal-fired power plant, yeah, that's of course uh, still grey or, uh, or black uh, 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 hydrogen that you produce. And you see also new technologies, for example, a technology that is also studied at uh, TU Delft, but at many other universities around the world, is that we don't produce with an, a photon uh, an electron, so to say, what we do in our solar PV cells, but that we produce with that photon that that split the water molecule and therefore we produce with a photon 
hydrogen and oxygen from water directly. This is still in the labor laboratory phase. It will last for 20, 30 years be before it will be uh, really a commercial uh, product. But this is, for example, one of these new technologies that you see is developing. But there are many others uh, like thermal pyrolysis where you can produce from fossil fuels, uh, from, from methane in this case, uh, by heating it up. Then the methane molecule is split into hydrogen and fixed carbon. So you don't release CO2 to the air. You have only fixed carbon, which yeah, can be stored or can be used as a fertilizer even in the, in the ground. <clears throat> um, but of course, we are talking uh, uh, mainly about uh, power to hydrogen from, uh, from, from splitting water. And there you have also different technologies. Uh, alkaline uh, technology, the, the PEM technology, and also high temperature solid oxide uh, electrolyzer cells, for example, and you see here the uh, reactions on the uh, anode and uh, cathode uh, sides of such an uh, electrolyzer. Um, but let me say an alkaline electrolyzer is already in use for about 100 years. The only thing is that we are not using it as a hydrogen production plant today, but we're using it as a chloride production plant today. And what do we do if we produce chlorine? Then we dissolve salt in water, natrium chlorine in water. And then the natrium chlorine is split into chlorine and of course the natrium part of it, natrium low. Uh, but at the same time, also the water is split. So as a byproduct of these uh, chlorine factories, you have also already uh, uh, hydrogen production, of course. Now, what is now a hydrogen production plant that is a chlorine production plant, you could say, where you don't dissolve water in, into the, uh, uh, dissolve uh, salt into the water. So that's not that uh, uh, difficult, but of course we have to scale up this technology to, uh, to, to, to get it cheaper uh, uh, all the way. But let me explain that most of the cost are, uh, for hydrogen production are determined by the electricity cost. And that is shown in this graph uh, from the IEA uh, report, The Future of Hydrogen, where on the right side you see as a function of the full load hours, the, uh, the, the hydrogen cost, uh, the levelized cost of hydrogen. And there, uh, there is a differentiation in the electricity cost. What you can see is that every cents per kilowatt hour or every 10 dollars per uh, megawatt hour gives a raise of the uh, hydrogen cost of about 0.5 uh, dollars per kilo. When you look to the left side, you see that uh, also as a function of the full load hours, you see the levelized cost of hydrogen, but there is a differentiation in the capex, the investment cost for the electrolyzer. And then at high full load hours, you don't see a lot of differentiation in the cost uh, of hydrogen. When you go, of course, to the lower full load hours, and that's the case when you have, for example, a solar cell, uh, solar PV uh, in, in, the, in Germany, and then we have only 1,000 uh, hours full load hours, then you see that there is also, of course, a large influence of the capex cost on the uh, hydrogen cost. But essentially is that to produce low cost hydrogen, you have to go to these sites where you have the good resources with the low cost of electricity production from solar and from wind. And then about the structure of this uh, technology, because it is, of course, also to reduce the capex cost. But when you look to the technology structure of an electrolyzer, it is a similar technology structure as for solar PV or batteries or fuel cells. The essential production element is a cell. Uh, and if you want to have more production output, then you place more cells into a module by PV or you stack these cells onto each other, and then it is an electrolyzer stack. And the balance of plant cost around such an electrolyzer stack that makes it an, uh, a system. And how do these uh, technologies become cheap? That is by mass production of the cells and the stacks in this case. And if you have an uh, a, a larger system than the balance of plant cost uh, 
as, a, uh, as part of uh, the uh, per kilowatt uh, are becoming lower. But it's already low when you have a, a balance of plant, uh, a system size of about 100 megawatt or 20 megawatt even. And when you go bigger, uh, there is not uh, a function anymore of the balance of plant cost that they become lower per kilowatt. But it is essentially scaling up production, which brings down the cost, like for solar PV and, uh, and batteries. Now, let me go back to the to, to what we have said about this is about the production, but now we have to transport and to uh, and to store it to bring it at the right uh, place and right time to the to the demand. And there you have to see that the characteristics of our gas and electricity system today are incredibly different. When you look to a gas system, then a gas field has a production capacity of say about 500 uh, terawatt hours a year. And when you have a large gas field like in Algeria, it is producing 1000 terawatt hours a year. But when you look to a power plant, and the biggest power plant in Europe is a coal-fired power plant in Poland, they are producing 30 terawatt hours a year. A scale factor of 10, 100 less, you could say, 30 less than uh, when you have a gas field. Also, when you look to the distance that you can uh, uh, yeah, transport your energy, now cables are yeah, transporting the electricity not, in, not more than over a thousand kilometers. But when you look to the pipeline infrastructure that we have with gas, it is uh, at least up to uh, 5,000 kilometers, you see it. And also you can ship it. That is not possible with electricity. But also one cable compared to one pipeline has a different size and capacity. A cable at the moment is one gigawatt and we are now going to build two gigawatt DC, four gigawatt DC, but a pipeline and for example, the Nord Stream pipeline uh, that is transporting gas from Russia to Germany has a capacity of 35 gigawatt. That's a big one. But on average, large transport pipelines have a capacity of 20 gigawatt. Now, also the, the, the infrastructure ownership is a, is a little different, but not so much. But you see also the storage capacity. When you look to a salt cavern, storage for gas, you can easily store about 500 gigawatt hours in a, a salt cavern and in empty gas fields it is even a factor of 10 larger but when you look to pumped hydrogen yeah a very large pumped hydro power plant have a storage capacity of about 25 gigawatt hours so that's and, and for batteries we are now building in, in australia one of the largest it is even not a one gigawatt hour uh, storage capacity that we have over there now hydrogen at the moment is a subsystem of the gas system because we are producing quite a lot of uh, hydrogen at the demand side. And that is at this moment, the demand for hydrogen is in making uh, uh, fertilizers. You produce from natural gas first hydrogen by steam methane reforming, and then you capture nitrogen from the air and you bind that to the hydrogen. And then you have uh, NH3, which is ammonia. Uh, and that's the main component of a fertilizer. But you use also a lot of hydrogen into uh, uh, the the uh, the refineries for uh, for cracking the the heavy oil fractions and the desulfurization. Now, what do you see as one of the problems already facing today? Looking to Germany, for example, here you see the offshore wind developments, and they have uh, just less than 10 gigawatt installed at their uh, site of uh, of the North Sea. The three cables are bringing it to the shore. But what you see is that when it is onshore, the cable uh, capacity uh, the, for the electricity to bring it to Munich or to Berlin is much too small. Overall, in 2020, they have produced with all the renewable energy, not only this, but the main part was the offshore, for 1.3 billion euro uh, uh, worth uh, on energy, which they have to be, which has to be curtailed because the capacity grid was not there. Also in the Netherlands, you see the same problem when we want to connect uh, onshore solar or wind. And uh, now uh, at several places, you see the red areas. There is not uh, sufficient capacity to uh, connect these things. And what is the reason? The reason is that the electricity grid 
as such, is much smaller than the uh, than the gas grid. It doesn't have the, the right capacity to, to absorb all this. So conversion to hydrogen makes it possible to use the gas grid, to reuse also the gas grid to convert it to uh, to, to uh, a hydrogen grid. And that's also what you see today as one of the main developments in uh, in, in Europe. For, for example, here on the most left side, you see the, the gas transport grid in Europe. And what you see is we have, of course, already a gas transport grid at the North Sea, where we transport the gas produced from these gas fields to the demand. And we see also that we have already from North Africa, a large gas transport pipeline system with a capacity of 60,000 gigawatts. Now for comparison, there are also two cables from Morocco to Spain. They have altogether 1.4 gigawatt of capacity. And in April this year, 21 countries with their TSOs, uh, the gas TSOs, have now said, okay, part of this uh, uh, energy system, uh, this gas pipeline infrastructure, salt gas and storage system, we will uh, go to uh, retrofit reuse for, uh, for hydrogen. Uh, about 75% they can uh, can reuse the other 25% they have to build new connections altogether 40,000 kilometers of pipelines and then we have a transport uh, hydrogen backbone throughout uh, Europe uh, in the next decades now you can transport hydrogen also by ship so here you see some uh, some variations you can do that by liquefying the hydrogen you can convert to ammonia because that is already an, uh, an, an in place. Eh? We have ships and we have these uh, ammonia uh, producing factories. So that is an easy way to do. Uh, liquid, liquid hydrogen is already there. We can liquefy hydrogen. We use it also to send our rockets in, into space. But the large scale up has to be done. So this is uh, rather new. But we can also bind it to another element like toluene, for example. And then it becomes a liquid. And then we can reuse our normal oil tankers to, to, to ship it all around the world. And that's, of course, the advances of this uh, technology to do that. But let's go one step to the, uh, to the, uh, to the storage issue. <clears throat> when you look, for example, in the Netherlands, but that's true for Germany, for the UK, for many Northwestern European countries and also the mid-European countries, but also for Japan, for many other places in the world, we see that uh, we have a lot of gas consumption in the Netherlands for heating. And when you look to the pattern over the year, then of course there is much more gas demand in winter time because it is colder outside than in summertime. And the variation in capacity is between five gigawatts in, uh, in, in summertime to about 40, 50 gigawatts, uh, you could say in winter time, a factor of 10 difference. Uh, in capacity that we need. Now, how do we solve this problem? Because we pump up gas every hour of the day, the whole year long, base load from a gas field. And in summertime, therefore, you pump up too much and that you store in empty gas fields or these, uh, these salt caverns for uses in wintertime. And when you look to the Netherlands, for example, this is true also for other countries, then we store we have a storage capacity of already 100 uh, 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 terawatt hour. That is almost the total uh, electricity demand that we have. And that is that can be done. Uh, and so this is how we solve the storage problem today for natural gas. The same thing can be done for hydrogen. We can store hydrogen uh, also in salt caverns and maybe also in some of these empty gas fields. It's already in place in salt caverns since 1972. In the UK, we have a salt cavern in use for hydrogen storage, so it's nothing new. You can store about 6,000 6, tons, which is about 240 gigawatt hours. And uh, the, the CAPEX costs are about 100 million. That means that the CAPEX cost for salt cavern storage of hydrogen is about a half a euro per kilowatt hour. But if we look to the battery, cost and you cannot store seasonally in batteries but okay let's assume that it is possible then the cost in future will be maybe 50 euros per kilowatt hour so here you see the factor of 100 that it is uh, cheaper to store hydrogen into uh, a salt cavern than uh, electricity in a battery 
Now, um, now, if you do some calculations, then you see that if you can produce for one cent per kilowatt hour with solar PV in Morocco, and you want to transport that in base load to, in this case, Germany, 3000 kilometer uh, on that side, that the cost to uh, have over there this uh, this uh, uh, this hydrogen uh, uh, transported to Germany in base load is about one and a half to two euros per kilo delivered in Germany, which is about four to five cents per kilowatt hour hydrogen cost, of course. And therefore, you see, if you have electricity cost in base load in uh, Germany of four to five cents, uh, five or six cents, then this will compete, of course, with, uh, with that uh, electricity cost uh, for production in, uh, in, in Germany. The developments uh, over the past two years for hydrogen were, uh, yeah, were amazing. Um, before 2020, there was not, uh, there were two countries that have uh, 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 released a hydrogen strategy that were Japan and South Korea. Korea. But in 2020, uh, up till now, we have about 40 uh, countries releasing a uh, hydrogen strategy. And also the European Union has released his uh, 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 hydrogen strategy in uh, July last year to install 40 gigawatt of uh, electrolyzer capacity in 2030 uh, and at least producing 10 million tons of renewable hydrogen in the, in the EU, but also looking to uh, uh, importing from, uh, from abroad, especially North Africa, where you can produce, of course, also very cheap hydrogen. That was the development in policy, but we have seen over the past year, especially the announcement of very large scale projects for uh, the production of uh, hydrogen from renewable power. Um, here you see the pipeline and the graph shows the pipeline in April this year, and that was 140 gigawatt of electrolyzer capacity. And the large is 67, and then you see it is going down to three uh, gigawatt. But today we have uh, a an, an pipeline of two, more than 200 gigawatt across 24 projects, and they are very, very large projects and now uh, announcements. It started with this project in Saudi Arabia, where they want to build a new city, Neom, on a surface area the size of Belgium. Uh, there you have very good uh, solar resources, but also very good wind resources. Uh, the wind speeds are about 10 meters per second, as you can see over here. They have announced a $5 billion investment for 4 gigawatt of solar and wind and a 2 gigawatt electrolyzer. And they want to produce hydrogen, convert the hydrogen to ammonia and ship the ammonia, for example, also to the port of Rotterdam. And then they want to bring the ammonia to the fueling stations and there they crack the ammonium back to uh, hydrogen for use in, uh, in, in cars and trucks and, uh, and buses, as you can see here. So this was exactly a year ago, 7 July of 2020. But today, for example, the 30th of May, there was the announcement of a 40 billion uh, green hydrogen project where they want to install 30 gigawatt of solar and wind power, 1% of the surface area. But when you compare that with the surface area of the Netherlands, it is uh, 20% and in, in Germany it is 2.5% 2, 2 of the surface area. So you see, you have much more space and of course very good resources over there. They want to produce electricity and drinking water because you need of course a demineralized water, but if you, you can produce also drinking water for the local market and they want to do this for the export. And you see many of these projects announced in the past uh, uh, past months. For example, this was of the 20, 28th of June, kind memorandum of understandings with governments for these large scale. So it is not in the one gigawatt scale, but it is really in the 10, 20, 30, 40 gigawatt scale, because that is the size of a gas producing. Uh, when you want to, uh, to, to fill a pipeline of 10 uh, gigawatt, you need at least 1 million tons of, uh, of uh, hydrogen to fill that pipeline. And therefore, we are not thinking in one gigawatt, but we are thinking now in 
uh, at least 10, 20 gigawatt of, uh, of, of uh, solar and wind and electrolyzers. Also offshore, you see the uh, two projects here in, the, in, in, in Europe, one in Germany, which is a 10 gigawatt uh, offshore wind uh, uh, hydrogen project, producing about this 1 million ton of hydrogen, as I said, uh, and they want to build a pipeline to transport the hydrogen produced offshore and convert it also from electricity to, uh, to, be, to hydrogen offshore or the hydrogen by pipeline. The other is the North H2 project, also 10 gigawatt of offshore wind where they want to uh, 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 use it at uh, for three to four gigawatt uh, on land electrolyzer, but the other six gigawatt, seven gigawatt will be offshore also producing and transporting by pipeline and bringing it in the hydrogen backbone that is developed in the Netherlands uh, uh, and will be ready in 2026. Hmm. And that's also the development for offshore wind. We see these very large developments of the, the, the offshore wind farm, wind turbines, uh, 15 megawatt, a lot of the electricity conversion equipment that you need because you need DC power, can directly be fed into the, the electrolyzer and you produce directly hydrogen and then you can transport that by a pipeline, smaller pipeline to a bigger pipeline to the coast and you can reuse also part of the uh, <coughs> gas infrastructure that you have at the North Sea. This is a study already two years ago, then you see they have uh, calculated with 10 megawatt and then they use it on a platform, but here you see also that they have proposed a 40 gigawatt uh, uh, wind offshore hydrogen uh, 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 system and of course hey, you can bring this uh, as electricity to the shore for example here in the uh, Peterhead in the north of Scotland but when you look to the capacity of the electricity grid you cannot bring it to uh, the 40 gigawatt never to uh, to for example uh, London but if you look to the pipeline infrastructure that you have uh, over there it's a it's piece of cake and you can transport easily that 40 gigawatt in the form of hydrogen through uh, pipelines through uh, to all of Europe. And that's the interesting thing. You don't have to build new infrastructure. You have to convert. And of course, that will cost us something. But that's, of course, much easier to do than building a new electricity uh, infrastructure. Now, and that's also what you see today, uh, for the, example, the port of Rotterdam. They think they will become a hub also to import and, and uh, throughput a lot of hydrogen to, for example, Germany. And now they are building their terminal facilities and uh, all the developments to import at least uh, in 2050 about 20 million tons of hydrogen. That's, by the way, the same amount of energy that, uh, that the whole of the Netherlands consumes. Uh, so that's what you see as a uh, throughput through this harbor. Now, to end with, I want to talk with you now about production, transport, and storage. And that, that is the main reason that you can uh, transport, uh, that you can produce with solar and wind at the good sites, the good renewable resource sites, where you have low cost. And then you can transport it uh, via hydrogen uh, to the demand at the right time, at the right place. And that is a cost effective way. To, uh, yeah, to solve your uh, energy uh, issues uh, for, uh, yeah, uh, uh, for, for a, a decarbonized uh, energy system. And then you can use the hydrogen in the same way that you can use gas in the industry for feedstock to produce high temperature heat and steam. Also for electricity balancing, when you don't have the right amount of electricity produced from solar and wind in your system, you can use it in transport by new technology, the fuel cell, and then you have electric transport, but the electricity is produced from the hydrogen by a fuel cell in your car or bus or whatever. And you can uh, heat your houses, not only by combusted, but in the future also by using uh, an, a fuel cell in your house that is producing electricity at the time that the solar panels on your house don't work in, uh, during the night and in the winter time. But at the same moment, they produce also heat, which is possible and can be used to heat up your house. So it is really um, electricity, of course, that is, is dominating the energy supply uh, by solar and wind. 
but hydrogen will be the energy carrier that can transport that electricity, uh, renewable electricity around the world. And that is also a an, an cycle because you use water, then you produce hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen is released to the air and you transport the hydrogen. And when you burn it or you use it in a fuel cell as an electrochemical conversion, then you use the same amount of hydrogen uh, uh, then you use the same amount of oxygen that you first have produced by your uh, electrolyzer and you release the same amount of uh, water that you first have used by your electrolyzer. So it's not like the present combustion uh, uh, from fossil fuels where you really use oxygen from the air to combust uh, your, uh, your, your fuel. Here you have first produced the oxygen that you then use uh, to uh, to uh, to produce an, uh, a useful energy carrier like electricity or heat that's what i want to tell you for this for this moment thank you very much thank you professor we will have one more presentation and then we will move forward with a q a session Our next speaker, second please. Uh, our next speaker is Ander Nogaretsev from the University of Delft and will be presenting development of an underwater gravity energy storage concept for offshore applications. Welcome, Ander. Hello, just share my screen. Okay. I hope you all are seeing this in uh, presentation mode. Yes, it's perfect. So, okay. Uh, my name is Andrea. Uh, I'm from Tio Delft, but I'm also from Petrobras, the Brazilian oil company. And uh, I came from Brazil to study uh, and develop a new energy storage system. And today I'll make a quick presentation of the, the system that I'm working in and uh, the next challenges. Um, just to remember that this is an ongoing work, so I will have a lot of uh, explanations about the, the, the basics of the project, but not many results to present right now, but let's see. Let's. So uh, to start with the motivation for, for this work, um, uh, the world is, is going to a more carbon neutral uh, ma uh, energy matrix, but uh, oil and gas will still be very important in the near future. So as you can see in this EA, EAA graphic, uh, oil and gas will uh, be very, very important in 2050. So it's also important to find a way to reduce the emissions in the oil and gas industry and also to make it more cost competitive. So uh, one of the ways to do that is to move from the low productivity oil fields to high productivity oil fields. Uh, and this, these fields uh, can produce a much more a higher amount of natural gas and oil with uh, the same infrastructure. So it, in the end, the life cycle, it's better. So some examples are the new uh, pre-salt uh, oil fields in Brazil. So one of them is this uh, marrow field in Santos Basin. That's my case of study. And in this particular field, we are installing the, the biggest FPSOs or floating production storage units uh, in the world. And it's a quite challenging place to work because it's uh, 164 kilometers from shore and the water depth is 2,100. So it's, it's a far offshore field. So this is a, a picture of a typical FPSO that we are starting there. And the idea is to produce as much as uh, oil with one FPSO as possible to reduce the impact. And uh, the limitations of, it, of of productivity is, is related to deck space because we have limited space on the, on it, and about power generation. Uh, the Brazilian legislation only allows us to produce 100 megawatts per uh, FPSO uh, if we, we use uh, oil or gas to burn. So it looks to be a, a, a lot of energy, but we already reached the, this limit, and we are trying to find another way to produce more oil and, uh, but. Uh, to do that, 
Uh, the first option that we are looking for is to move part of the process plant to the subsea. So we, with that, we can have a more efficient process. So we will uh, demand less energy. And also we uh, use less deck space. So this is an example from Petrobras, a patented system that we developed to uh, processing the, the gas. And another example is this field from Econor. So we can see that it's, um, it's a global uh, initiative to do this kind of installation in the subsea. And another uh, good way to reduce our, uh, the emissions of the oil industry is to use renewable energy. That's a typical case of, of Econor on the high wind tampen. And they are producing uh, some wind energy to, to power the platforms. Uh, another good option is to connect to shore. But as you can see in Brazil, it's, uh, it's too far away. It's 100, more than 100 kilometers away. So it, it will be very expensive to connect to shore to, to, to use um, green energy. So uh, we are looking for solutions like this one from Saipen that's a uh, floating wind turbine. Um, in the first moment, the, the wind there in this region is quite good, but we have some, some problems that we need to address. So um, uh, the main problem is, is about the, the uh, fluctuation of power supply from the, high, from the wind turbines. So uh, in my work, I'm, I'm working for a solution to a subsea system at Merrill Oil Field. Uh, the system that we choose to, to power is a water injection system. Uh, this one is an example of a system that can be installed at this 2,000 meters of water depth, and it consumes 2.2 megawatts of energy. And water injection systems is a good option to, to study because it, it can uh, operate with flexible energy. It, it don't need to, to run at constant power, so we can have a, a little bit of flexibility that makes it easier. But uh, in the first uh, study, we are trying to find the best power source to power this, this system. And then uh, we need to find a good energy storage solution as we want to, to work with renewable power. So uh, the first phase, we studied, uh, we select the power source using a multi-criteria decision analysis. So uh, we compared all the, the possible renewable energies that we have there that are current waves, uh, floating solars and OPEC. And also uh, compared with the more traditional solutions like uh, uh, direct gas burners or um, we're using hydrogen as a, in fuel cells in the in subsea applications, or even more uh, extreme solutions like nuclear power. And uh, comparing all the solutions, the winner for this place was a uh, floating wind. So we start to, to analyze that. Uh, I have a, a published paper about this, this topic. Uh, I can send to, to you and if you want to know more details about it. And the next step was to, to see how the, the power will be. So this is a, a graph showing the average uh, energy production in this, the, in this area per month, considering that we are using a high blade uh, X turbine of two, uh, 12 megawatts. So during the year, the average uh, energy production will be below six megawatts or below of the half of the power of the turbine. And we have a, a, a very big fluctuation and uh, the, the thing that's more critical for, for an, uh, the kind of application that we are thinking that's a completely off-grid application are these months from March to June, July, where the energy is uh, energy production is most of the time below the, the average of the year. So we need to find some way of dealing with this uh, so-called bad months that we have here. And uh, looking to uh, energy storage solutions, uh, we have a, a, a huge uh, number of, of possible solutions. Um, the first ones that we look at are plug wheels and capacitors for very small energy scale, so in the second scales in time. And, uh, and the, the high time of energy storage and high powers are uh, pumped hydro and hydrogen. But uh, we are looking mainly for gravity energy storage. It's, it's, uh, we selected this, guy, the, this technology because it fits in the, the power that we need and the, and the time that we need to store the energy. So uh, talking about uh, offshore gravitational energy storage, 
we have some uh, technologies that are devel uh, being developed. Uh, none of them are commercial yet. So um, mainly to store energy in, in, in this way, you need to have a very high uh, weights like this one that you can see here of uh, 100 pounds. And yeah, you need to, when you have energy, you can just lift this, this heavy weights and keep them on the surface. So when you need more power, you just uh, uh, let it go down and you convert its potential energy into electric energy. So uh, these two uh, solutions presented here, uh, both needs to have some um, a robot assisted system because they just uh, uh, pick up the, the weights from the, the seafloor, the seabed and lift them to something, to some uh, floating structure. Uh, this kind of solution is suitable for our oil field because it uh, moves a lot, and uh, the sea the seabed in our oil field is not empty, an empty space, so it, it can be dangerous because you can uh, have some interference with the other production systems, and it can limit the, the technology. And there's also there's not a much uh, reference for off, for these offshore applications, so we need to develop a new concept. So uh, our main idea is to start with uh, a subsea uh, buoyant system that's, uh, that Petrobras developed to support risers in higher depth. That's basically, it's a, a floater connected to tension lag uh, systems. So it's like a tension lag platform, but it stays like 200 meters below the, the sea surface. And in this first application that we use it, it, it supports the, the weight of the risers that are the, the, the pipes that, that uh, uh, take the oil from, from the well wheels to the platform. And by, by doing that, it is used to reduce the load on the, the vessel. So our idea is to adapt this concept with the with concept of gravity energy storage system. So we installed a, this one platform in the middle of the way from, from the the bottle to the surface. So we can uh, use this almost 2000 meters of water depth to, uh, to move our weights. So we have a, a, a very big displacement of the weights. So we can store a lot of energy. And in the first concept, we, we analyzed the use of two uh, GE turbines, the Hellblade, and to power two of this subsea water injection system. And this, uh, our UGES or underground, underwater gravity energy storage will provide the balance of energy. So in our first moment, we made some dimensioning of the system. So we use era five wind data for its uh, hourly uh, medium of the, the, the wind data. So we have the, the, the power curve of the turbine and we have the full curve of the pump. And with this data, we make some time simulations so uh, we can see how the system will operate. And then we make an um, iterative process to, uh, to change the parameters of the energy storage system until we reach our goals of uh, mean flow for the system during a year and number of stops. The number of stops is a critical parameter for subsystems systems because uh, as you stop and uh, start again, uh, a pump, you reduce its life. And as we, uh, as our system installs the two, met, two meters of water depth, it's very difficult to make maintenance of this system. So it's very important to keep it running uh, as much as possible to reduce the, um, to increase the life of this equipment and make it more av available. So, uh, after this, we, we make the simulation and uh, based on the uh, structure support, this is the UGES uh, support system based on the, the, the folder that I presented before. We, uh, we have a two, uh, two column systems, each one with uh, four weights. So every way, uh, each weight is a, a root concrete cylinder with 2.5 meters of radius and 10 meters of height. And it weights 474 tons, each one of them. 
So with this eight system, we can uh, produce a maximum power of 4.64 megawatts. That's it's uh, the, the, the maximum power of the pumps considering the power losses on the cables and on the converter. And a top, with a total energy storage of 10.3 uh, uh, megawatt hours, sorry, it's uh, gigawatt hours, it's, it's wrong, the unit, sorry. And uh, the, we can discharge at full power for 4.26, uh, four hours and 26 minutes. But uh, the system is designed in a way that it will pro not provide the full power to the, um, to the subsea pumps. It will have a, 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 a control logics that allow it to produce uh, the maximum water injection until we reach uh, a level that we call the critical level of energy store. Then it will reduce the power outputs to just keep the, the pumps running at the minimum load to keep it running the maximum time. So to avoid the, the um, the stops and starts of the system. And one very important parameter when we are talking about uh, uh, a wad, uh, water system that uh, the weights will um, move inside the water. So we have a lot of drag forces. So we try to reduce the maximum the, the speeds of this to reduce the drag. So we limit the, the, the speeds of this weight to one meter per second to uh, reduce the drag. Um, but we have some, some problems with the system. Uh, the first one is the dynamic behavior of the system. As we have a, a sea currents, uh, the currents will make the, the weights uh, move like pendulums. So we expect to have some uh, uh, oscillation on it. So it's important to guarantee that this oscillation uh, will not make the the cylinders collide one with another and need them collide with the marine lines. So uh, we need to study how it's this behavior. Uh, the, the first advantage of the system compared to the other that I presented before is that the, cur the sea current is much higher in the surface. So when you put it like 200 meters below the surface, it will have a, a, a less influence of the sea currents. And also it will not be affected by the waves. So that's, that's why we choose to put it a little bit down. Uh, so uh, to study this, this dynamic behavior, we can go to solutions like uh, CFD. But, but as we, we saw in the presentations yesterday, CFD can be very expensive in this case. So we try a more um, phenomenological approach. So we will study the, how, the currents will affect the, the movement and make it uh, the cylinder vibrate. Uh, so we we'll look at the uh, VIV of this, uh, the vortex induced uh, vibration of the cylinder. And we will couple this with the model of uh, the, the dynamic model of a spherical pendulum. So by doing that, we can uh, simulate the, the behavior of it. So um, basically, our numerical model is a same analytical model based on the work of Yang Pugh, uh, uh, that also is also a colleague from TU Delft that finished his work uh, in 2019. And in this model, we will, uh, the, this, the, this, the cylinder will have a behavior like, uh, uh, it, it will act like a Van der Poel oscillation or oscillator. So it, uh, we can simulate the dynamic behavior of it. Uh, copying the cross flow and the line of vortex induced vibration. So, the, and this system is high, nonlinear. So, this is the first challenge to model it. And uh, it will be implemented and solved in commercial software. So we are making a code in Python to, to solve it. So, uh, now we are working in the validation of the model that we already developed. That that's not so trivial because the size of the cylinders that we are working with are quite bigger than the normal size of anything that you find in literature. So we have some difficulties to, to evaluate the drag coefficients and, uh, and to, to, to make the system work properly. 
Then after validate this model, we will evaluate the effect of waves and the next distance of the cable. Because in the first model, we don't consider the waves as we are quite below the surface. And we also consider that the, the cables are rigid lines. So uh, we will have to evaluate it. And by the end, we will have to, to evaluate the synchronization effect. So uh, that's a very important phenomenon when you have uh, more than one pendulum uh, oscillating in the same surface. In the initial moment, they tend to be uh, like handle. If they have a handle movement, they are not synchronized. But as they they keep on moving, with some time, it will, will start to transfer its uh, momentum to the the connecting surface or the structure. And after some time, they will start to move in a synchronized way. So we we'll have to look at this. In our case, the synchron the synchronization effect is important because. It, if it occurs, it will be very helpful because it will uh, somehow avoid collisions because they will be uh, shaking in a synchronized way. But if they, uh, in other hand, uh, become uh, in, uh, synchron uh, not synchronized but in in have inverted phase, they will certainly collide. So we have to evaluate that and also uh, if you have good uh, results until this phase, we will also evaluate some ways to uh, reduce the vibration of the system and to keep it more stable. So basically, this is what I have to present now. And uh, I, I need to thank for my company, for Petrobras, that's supporting my work. Also for my promoter, Andre McIntyre, and for my co-promoter, that's Antonio Laguna. And also the master student that work, is working with me, that's Frankie Moles. Uh, he will uh, defend. Uh, next month, and he helped me a lot with the study of the energy balance, and he is also the, uh, studying the installation process for this kind of system. So uh, this is also my mail if you, someone wants to, to, to send me a directly cash question, and uh, we can go to the question and answer section. Thank you, Andre. Uh, I would ask uh, both you and Professor Wick to turn on your uh, videos, your cameras. Okay, so we'll start now with the first Q&A session. We already have a couple of questions uh, from Pilar, I think it's for Professor Wick. Uh, why use ammonia as a transport of hydrogen instead of pure water? With water, we would say the conversion uh, H2O to H2 to ammonia and back to hydrogen. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question, but pure water is of course not an energy carrier. Uh, you produce from water uh, with energy, uh, with electricity, uh, hydrogen, and that will be the energy carrier. So you have to transport the hydrogen, not the water. Uh, and that can be done as hydrogen, but when you, uh, through a pipeline, it is a gas, uh, you use it as a gas through a pipeline. But if you want to transport it over larger distances than 5,000 kilometers, uh, you need to ship it, and then you have several options. One of these options is to, uh, to, to make it a liquid eh, because you want to store as much energy in such a ship as you can. And when it is only a gas, you cannot store a lot of energy in, uh, in such a ship. So then you make it liquid, but that is very cold. Eh? The temperature uh, to make hydrogen liquid is minus 253 degrees, eh, 20 degrees above absolute zero temperature. It's possible, we do it already, the technology is there, but that is really a process that has to, to scale up. And then it is easier to convert it, hydrogen with nitrogen from the air into ammonia, ship the ammonia. The ammonia is liquid at minus 33 degrees. So that is, uh, is, is an easier way to transport it. Uh, and it is already done. Huh? We ship already around the world a lot of ammonia because it is the main compo component of the fertilizer. And therefore, this is an easier way and also cheaper way to transport the hydrogen, despite the conversion losses and, uh, and, and costs that are connected to this, then uh, transporting it as, uh, as liquid hydrogen at the moment. Hey, thank you, Professor. There's another question. Uh, this one is for Andre. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation. I was wondering whether you've looked at the impact of co-locating other technologies, such as floating PV, to help overcome low 
electricity production from the wind turbines during the summer months and how this might affect, might change, sorry, the energy storage requirements. Oh, okay. Uh, we studied the, op the, the options of uh, collocating some uh, floating PV and also uh, current uh, energy generators in this place. Uh, the problem with solar PV is that uh, for this higher depth and uh, consider the, the maximum wavelength that, that we have there, uh, there is no techn available technology to make it. Of course, there is no uh, floating wind turbine also for 2,000 meters, but we believe that's more feasible, uh, considering our knowledge of, of moving systems and uh, solar winds for, for this period. And of course, it will help a lot if we can put some PV. Uh, we are in the salt hemisphere there, so uh, the worst months for, for us are not the summer months, the summer the wind is quite good there, but the problem are more in the autumn. But yes, uh, the, the, the PV will help a lot if we can do it. For sure. Okay, thank you. There's uh, another question. Um, great presentation. Perhaps I missed this part, but isn't there an idea to implement this gravity ba battery onshore? For example, hanging inside a well of some sort? Is this way, in this way, you would avoid complexities from the waves and everything that is a result from being underwater? Yes, um, there are some implementations of this, this kind of technology on shore. Uh, it's, uh, there are two, co two companies that have this as a commercial product. One is implemented in wheels, the existing wheels. And another one is constructing like uh, uh, lifters to, to make this. Um, it's, it, the technology is quite different because it has the advantage to, to not be uh, in water, so it's had less dra drag, and also of not being uh, affected by waves. But it's very expensive to build a power to lift uh, the weights on shore. So you will never have a 2,000 meters tower to, to make it on shore. So uh, to make it offshore has this advantage. But in, in this particular scenario that we are uh, evaluating, we have no connection to shore because the distance is, is very 164 kilometers with very uh, high water depths that can be 2,000 meters or higher. So uh, we need a, a, a solution that can stand alone, that can work stand alone in the sea. So storage on shore is not an option for us. Okay, thank you, Andre. Um, are any of the panelists, do you have any questions for the speakers? I would uh, like to ask Professor Van Wyk a question. You had talked about how um, the existing natural gas pipeline can be used for hydrogen. Uh, now, of course, uh, I would imagine that if there is a conversion, you probably cannot be using it for both substances at the same time. So you would require a conversion from natural gas to hydrogen. Now, given that natural gas is still being used in like, what kind of a timeline do you foresee where actually hydrogen can be transported through these pipelines uh, and being commercially utilized? Yeah, the, 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 that's a very good question. Um, but uh, if you look to the gas infrastructure, it is not one pipeline. It is uh, when you look, for example, from the production fields from the north of the Netherlands uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Italy even, but or, or to Rotterdam, then you have uh, several pipeline systems. And what you do at first is, of course, you don't change all the pipelines from natural gas to, to, uh, to, to hydrogen. You only convert one. And if you go a step further, then you take the next one. And, and the next one. So the system that I showed you also for the European hydrogen backbone is only one pipeline that is uh, converted from natural gas to hydrogen. But it is still possible to transport uh, uh, huge amounts of uh, natural gas uh, at the same time, but not in the same pipeline, of course. Right. I understand. Yeah. Um, Amarina, I think there's another question in the Q&A. Yes, um, but I, I, am, I think it's for uh, the professor, professor Week as well. Uh, very interesting presentation. Do you see hydrogen being competitive also at an hourly, daily timescale, or is that an area where batteries would win? 
um, um, we will certainly have batteries and, and hydrogen next to each other. And also on a highly hourly and, 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 uh, and time scale, you have this. But uh, be aware in our gas system, we have already storage in the pipelines itself, and which is not in the electricity system itself. The pipeline that is called line packing, uh, we can, we can uh, uh, change our uh, consumption of, uh, of natural gas and also hydrogen yeah, on second scale to, to, to hourly scales to, uh, and for example, in the total pipeline system, we have about a day of storage. Uh, so it is possible to do it uh, in the hydrogen system, but of course, when you have electricity, you produce it on your roof uh, of your house. You don't go to convert to hydrogen and store the hydrogen and then use it. No, then you are going to use a battery uh, for, uh, for the day-night uh, fluctuation. So it is part of the total system and you will use it both, but also with uh, hydrogen or gas at the moment we can store for for seconds for for uh, for, for days uh, whatever you want that's already in the system thank you professor uh one more question and then we'll move with, with um, uh, the rest of the presentations uh this is for andre thank you for the very interesting and insightful presentation i think LOHC is considered a way to transport hydrogen. A solution can be the tow ends, as I have heard. I would like to ask if you're aware about the safety of using tow end for transporting hydrogen, as in highly concentrations, I think it might cause neurological problems to people. Yeah. Well, I think I cannot answer that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I think this is a question for me too. Um, yes, you bound it to toluene. That's one of the examples. There are other uh, uh, materials, but toluene, you have to be very uh, uh, careful indeed, like with ammonia, because that is also very uh, uh, hazardous. Yes? So you don't want to have bits of ammonia and then you uh, poison all your life in the sea if, uh, when, it, uh, when it happens. So uh, it needs careful consideration and uh, certainly uh, also when you bind it to toluene it's only a carrier so what you do is you bind it and uh, at the moment that you are uh, exporting it uh, you dehydrogenate it and then you have the toluene and you ship the toluene back but it is essentially indeed that this uh, doesn't cause any any leakage and therefore uh, uh, you have to be very uh, good in engineering all these things but the other thing is also find other uh, products that can do the same and that have uh, less uh, yeah consequences for uh, yeah for for leakage etc so that that's uh, that's the, uh, the 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 thing but uh, these three main routes and i have mentioned toluene as an example uh, it, when you make it a liquid, it is possible to reuse your uh, normal oil tankers. And that's, of course, an, a, a huge uh, advantage uh, when you can reuse these uh, oil tankers for other purposes. Okay, thank you, Professor and Andre. Uh, now we'll move with the second part of the session. Uh, our next speaker is Omar Ibrahim from the University, of, uh, University College Cork. And his presentation is coupling floating offshore wind turbine farms with green hydrogen production and transportation. Welcome, Omar. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, I believe now you can see my screen, right? Um, not yet. It's not yet on presentation mode. Yeah. Now, yes. can. now it's perfect. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this very interesting talk. Uh, like now, uh, hydrogen is my greatest passion. So like everything uh, that have been in discussion uh, for the past hour and a few minutes uh, was really interesting for me. Thanks, Professor Ed, for this uh, very insightful uh, keynote speak. And uh, what I would be talking uh, for the upcoming 15 minutes is all about one route of this uh, green hydrogen production uh, that uh, is thought to be promising. Uh, I'm working on floating offshore wind and green hydrogen production. And this is a presentation titled Dedicated Floating Offshore Wind to Hydrogen Onshore or Offshore Electrolysis. My name is uh, Omar Ibrahim and uh, I'm coming from the Step for Wind uh, project. Um, I'm currently based in Ireland at University College Cork. 
I would have, uh, this is my agenda for today. Um, I would start with an introduction of my project and motivation behind it and the main key question, which is where is the electrolyzer and would draw some system configurations and would then end this up with some conclusions and future work for my PhD. So as I said, I'm coming from the Step for Wind uh, project, and uh, this stands for Novel Design Production Operation Approaches for Floating Wind Turbine Farms. It's a European industrial doctor program that aims to deliver 10 PhDs. Uh, that's a Marie Curie uh, training network, and Axel is actually our project coordinator from TU Delft. So I'm somehow in contact with TU Delft as well. Um, it's a collaboration between three economic institutions as well as five uh, industrial entities. And my project is, as I said, the collaboration between UCC in Ireland and or eCatapult in the UK. The motivation for my work is coming from basically what all have been in discussion, uh, hydrogen or green hydrogen. Uh, according to ARENA, hydrogen will account for 12% of the total final energy use by 2050. And this would be dedicated for the green hydrogen as uh, So to achieve this much of decarbonization, green hydrogen should be the leader in the energy mix. And to achieve this, we need 5,000 gigawatts of hydrogen electrolyzer. Uh, just to give you an insight, what we have at the moment is just 0.3 gigawatts. So it's a huge expansion in the hydrogen electrolyzer. Green hydrogen would compete with the price of blue hydrogen by 2030. And this is the main challenge for the green hydrogen is how pricey it is at the moment. And this would be achieved by using the first key uh, cost driver, giving it uh, like uh, like the, the, the least thing that we can achieve is by having the lowest cost renewable electricity. And the second uh, main uh, cost driver is the electrolyzer itself. But um, if those can be really, really uh, gone uh, low in cost would have uh, a possible green hydrogen production cost of 17 euros uh, per megawatt hour. This is the cost of the electricity. The 17 euros, that's the least that uh, by this cost that would compete with the blue hydrogen. And if this rapid scale up, as I said, in conjunction with developments and electrolyzers, the price of the green hydrogen can reach 1.2 years per kilogram. So that's the work that is in the focus now. The motivation is linking floating offshore wind as my title suggests, but why specifically floating offshore wind could be a good potential for this? Is it because it gives access to a wide unused uh, offshore wind, uh, like this is beyond 130 kilometers offshore, and uh, it's believed that the floating offshore wind uh, is having a significant cost reduction that it can be subsidy free by 2050, according to our e-catapult. Uh, like when you go this depth, uh, when we go this far uh, offshore, steady wind speeds can be available and that help a steady hydrogen production. I'm talking about dedicated farms just for hydrogen production. So like the whole farm will be just producing hydrogen. And this would have less visual impacts from um, a social uh, perspective. And uh, by this technology that can offer a reasonable scale for how much green hydrogen really need in the energy mix. But the main question would be, where is the electrolyzer? Where should the electrolyzer be installed? Uh, starting from the floating offshore wind, uh, that would be a gigawatt scale farm. And uh, the main uh, or the first uh, route would be just conventionally producing electricity and transporting it via subsea cables and having the electrolysis onshore and then the produced hydrogen would be uh, transported for the rest of the supply chain. And this was already explained uh, earlier today. And we have two other uh, coupling routes. One, uh, both of them are offshore where the electrolysis takes place offshore. The first is decentralized and the second is, is centralized. Uh, the produced hydrogen would be then transported via subsea hydrogen pipelines and it would reach the shore for the rest of the supply chain as well. The first concept is that the onshore concept would start from the floating offshore wind and uh, it's believed that uh, like going as maximum as possible would um, enhance the techno-economic viability of this. So at the moment I'm using the 10 megawatt DTU but uh, just as for the sake of some um, 
modeling challenges. But in principle, you can go uh, with the highest uh, capacity. So the 15 megawatt is the way to go in the near future. And even 20 megawatt turbine is um, in the very near future would be live. Uh, the most convenient uh, floating offshore platform is the SPAR here. The SPAR concept is already mature and it's uh, it's been accounted that the capacity factor for the high wind Scotland using the SPAR is 57% last year. So this is a very good advantage. And this would have the electricity produced uh, transported via uh, dynamic cables uh, at the, the, the production point. Uh, this is pure electricity. And then it would reach an offshore substation that would raise the voltage uh, to be exported into HVDC system. Uh, this would have the voltage raised for sure for efficient transport. And then that would make use of submarine HVDC system. HVDC is the way to go uh, uh, beyond uh, distances uh, that exceed 60 kilometers. And then that would reach an onshore uh, substation to step down the, uh, the voltage and operate an onshore electrolysis facility. The most convenient electrolysis technology here is the alkaline for how this is a cost efficient solution. And there are no restrictions for the, the footprint of the electrolysis or the area or so on. Uh, this would have the, the hydrogen uh, produced then uh, undergone the rest of the supply chain storage distribution this is not really the main scope uh, of my work. And the main disadvantage of this concept is that it has for, uh, around 4.7% uh, of electric loss using uh, the HVDC system, as well as having to have uh, um, this system implemented from scratch or having um, this infrastructure. And this adds really to the cost. And as well as the, the maximum uh, HVDC VTC capacity in the market available at the moment is two gigawatts. So if we're talking about a greater farm size, that was, this would have to have several, let's say four uh, gigawatt farm, it would have to have two parallel HVTC transport system. And this is a major addition to the cost. The second concept is the decentralized offshore concept, which typically starts with the farm. However, here, uh, the semi-submersible floating platform, I'm here using the N-Wind platform, is the way to go for how this can have an area of integrating the electrolysis facility on the floating deck itself. Um, the Dolphin project uh, that uh, Professor Ad um, uh, presented earlier in his presentation is a very good example to what I'm working on. This electrolysis facility would have to have the PIM as the electrolysis technology because it's compact and this is crucial now on the area of the floating deck. Uh, this would have also cooling um, facility for the electrolyzer seawater desalination because the, the salinity of the water um, is a challenge for the electrolyzers. So they have to have um, pure water as well as it has to have as well a backup power, uh, backup power uh, system here. The battery is the way to go. And uh, this would have to have as well a hydrogen buffer which is simply a tank uh, before the hydrogen gets transported in the main static hydrogen pipeline that I would present later. Uh, at the point of production, um, there is this dynamic, so to say, cables known as risers. They are already used in the oil and gas industry. And these um, dynamic cable, dynamic uh, pipelines uh, are called flexible risers and they, the, the, the the configuration uh, meant to be used here is the unbounded uh, flexible rises that comes from the range from 0.05 meters to 0.5 meters diameter. This would have all the hydrogen uh, um, got from individual turbines coagulated or collected and then uh, uh, being uh, transmitted in the main hydrogen uh, sea bed pipelines. Uh, this would have to have a maximum of 70 bars uh, be because the, the hydrogen embrittlement is the main challenge for this topology of having the offshore hydrogen pipelines. The maximum we can go in diameter is, is believed to be 1.8 meters. However, one meter diameter uh, is sufficient. It's, it's an analogy between the pressure you're transmitting the hydrogen and the, the diameter you have. Uh, but like this is uh, roughly... Um, uh, an estimate for such uh, a big farm just for hydrogen production. Uh, 
Uh, one more advantage for the PIM uh, electrolysis technique is, is it, it produces hydrogen at a pressurized way. So no need to have any compressors. The, the output pressure is sufficient for the transmission uh, to the shore. Uh, and then the, the, the hydrogen would be undergone the rest of the supply chain. The third and the last uh, coupling concept is the centralized one. Uh, this is less complex because here the decentralized one uh, have this complexity, as you can see, that you're integrating a whole new system on an existing system. So the complexity here is something to consider. But shifting to the centralized offshore concept, here the SPAR can be used as well, just like the onshore concept, because you're not integrating anything on the floating uh, deck itself. And this would make use of the dynamic cables used in the onshore as well, uh, because this is electricity. And then this electricity would be operating um, an electrolysis facility all alone centrali centralized, just like what the title suggests. So like uh, it's more of a vessel that has all the electrolysis facility for the whole farm just in, a one, in one place. Uh, this would have seawater desalination units, and this can make use of the alkaline uh, technology or how the space here is not an issue, just like the decentralized one. And uh, this would also have to have large diameter flexible risers at the collection point of hydrogen. And this hydrogen would be transported again to the same offshore uh, hydrogen pipelines presented in the decentralized concept. So here, uh, there is an environmental challenge is that when you're doing seawater desalination, the brine discharge is a challenge here for the environment because you would have the brine in a centralized way. That wasn't the case in the decentralized one, but here it's way, way less complex. Um, the high, uh, the, the vessels that would integrate all the electrolysis facility uh, would contribute to a, um, to a major percentage of the cost. So that's another disadvantage for this centralized concept. In conclusion, or the main takeaways uh, for this is that there is a potential synergy between large dedicated floating wind farms and uh, having a green hydrogen reduced cost. The onshore system concept fits best at relatively short distances. And as I said, it would have this uh, electric loss uh, challenge as well as the, the maximum capacity of the um, uh, electric cables of two gigawatts. The decentralized system concept fits best at relatively long distances with potential scaling up because this would make use of uh, the offshore pipelines, which can be transporting a 10 gigawatt, for example, and this would be replacing five, two gigawatts of the HVDC systems used on the onshore, but it's complex as I addressed before. The centralized system concept might compete with the decentralized one based on the project's location. So if you're having your location uh, in a very deep water, the SPAR concept, which is used in the centralized uh, system, would fit would be would be a, fit, uh, a better fit, and by this uh, this could be economically more viable, and like from all the from all the perspectives, it's also uh, ongoing development at the moment. The highest uh, electrolysis um, one 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 electrolysis stack uh, would go. And uh, it's believed that in, in a megawatt scale, you would have uh, even, even gigawatts, uh, just one electrolysis stack would be operating, uh, like how, how many of the turbines, let's see how would that be developed. But this is another edge for the centralized system concept. For the future work of my uh, PhD in general, uh, I'm working at the moment at a detailed conceptual design for the decentralized concept. I picked the decentralized one to go further for how this is really interesting and it has a lot of research questions. Um, and then I would follow this up with a full techno-economic analysis on the decentralized concept, as well as um, having the energy policy vector as uh, a whole final checkpoint of my PhD for not like you can't really introduce green hydrogen without studying how you would implement it from a political uh, perspective. So that was all from my side and uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Omar. Our next speaker is the energy storage and hydrogen, um, oh, sorry, of the energy storage and hydro the hydrogen session will be Dr. John Noble from Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. After his presentations, we will have a short Q&A session. And after that, one of the presentations from yesterday's hydrodynamic session will continue. 
Dr. John Novu will be presenting um, battery energy storage in offshore wind farms, as well as towards achieving net zero green hydrogen from offshore wind. Okay, Welcome. Thank, you. thank you very much. I'm just going to share my screen now. And let me know if you can see my screen. Not yet. I think I should come up now. Yes, uh, we just, we're not seeing yet on the presentation mode. Is that better now? Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, yes, I'm just going to give an overview of, of battery energy storage in the context of offshore wind farms. And um, this is just going to basically give an overview of um, more or less from an investment angle of what we need to be doing to promote um, battery storage co-located with offshore wind farms. So first slide here is just really about talking about what the problem is. So at the moment, we, we have battery storage, mainly based on lithium batteries, which are a very mature technology now um, available, mostly at grid scale. Um, we do have um, offshore wind farms where some of these batteries are co-located with. But um, the question is, how do we promote um, further investment into um, these technologies with battery energy storage, collective option wind farms as well? So this description just shows basically um, a battery co-located with a wind farm having the same connection point and having to perform some sort of grid service or incinerator service to the grid. Linking to the next slide. So one way to approach the problem is to look at it from the perspective of what you know a wind farm developer or operator or whoever would want to have this on their wind farms would like to see out of it and all, all that comes into understanding if it's a benefit uh, in terms of the profits you probably would want to make make out of this so um, yeah, sort of two ways. Usually you can look at this. You can look at it from the return of investment, ROI, which is the net profit on investments, cost versus the investment, um, cost, sorry, or the investment versus the cost you put into your um, the whole infrastructure and everything in regards to this as well. Another aspect is you either use the MPV, which is net present value, which sort of considers the cash flows you expect at present and the cash flows you expect in the future. And from that, if you have positive and negative values, you can tell if it's worth a good investment or not. So with these options as well, so why, what really you need to be thinking about to help people to come to the decision on having batteries on wind farms to have an option that would maximize the, any of these two metrics of interest. So, so the question is, how do we then handle all the various variable fixed, fixed and variable costs and have an optimal planning system for battery energy storage collected with wind farms? Um, there are so many factors which you need to consider and this, this diagram just shows you sort of some of them and, and there are even more that needs to go into sort of like the investment decisions you need to make in terms of battery storage being located at wind farms. Um, for example, the CAPEX costs and the operational expenditure costs as well. Um, considering the fact you probably will be connected at the same um, connection points, uh, if you need to either upgrade the network or not, there should, could be some potential connection charges in there. Imbalance energy charges can also come in. Um, in the UK, we have green subsidy for renewables as well. It's a factor that I in. And um, there's been mostly around wind farm control, the idea of how you can use your wind farms now to start to actually participate more effectively in ancillary services. And in each of these services, there are different payment mechanisms which you need to follow in terms of the charges you might get for penalties and different things around that. And as well as how do you operate your wind farm within the existing electric markets with the market prices variations and the various grid connection constraints and grid codes compliance you have to adhere to. So these are some of those challenges, but there are even so many more challenges that you need to put at. So next thing is what do you do? And the idea which we've been working on with the University of Strathclyde is we created two, which is called an energy storage planning tool that takes into consideration all these different um, aspects. So the, the figure you have here is a GUI interface of the current development of that tool. And what this tool does is to find out the best size 
of a battery that you should collocate with your wind farm. Um, it also looks at how you coordinate the wind farm and battery energy storing functions in terms of the charging and discharging of the batteries um, in relation to performing different ancillary services. So with that as well, you'd, we have created a number of um, variations of scenarios of how you could bid into frequency service auctions in the UK with the battery and also how you maximize that usage with the current um, usage of the wind farm. And at the end of it all, the tool works, as I said earlier, on to find out either based on ROI or MPV, if this is um, the best sort of profitable options for, based on the revenue streams for battery storage. So this is just a mock representation of sort of what the tool does. So in this, in this situation, we've developed around 17 different strategies based on different operation parameters as well. And just like you can see that it takes into consideration, um, you can input your wind, wind um, power profiles, um, the grid frequency, you have certain optimization variables which you're working towards. And we have actually developed a detailed model for a lithium battery, which could be switched into any other configuration of a battery if it needed. And you know that gives you also that plus degradation of the batteries and you know the state of charge and state of energy is fed back in to make those decisions as well in understanding when best to use your battery and not to deplete the energy, energy resources of the battery as well. And we have a number of scenarios which are built around the frequency response services. And we basically look at that as well. And at the end, this sort of um, tool spits out a cost and benefits analysis, which considers the CAPEX, OPEX, all the different charges that we need to consider as well of the payment mechanisms and as well as other services. Um, we do also initial work of how this could be used to provide, for example, black start services and the tool kind of starts to give a rough idea of how much money it should cost for that to make this a financial, financially viable option as well. So that's that the tool. So why is it important now is the fact that um, we have different services coming on board and frequency response services in the UK. So dynamic containment, and we have also dynamic low high and even some newer services. And these services are more open to energy limited providers. So in this case, energy Uh, frequency services in the UK dynamic containment. And the, the diagram you see on your right is basically the profile for the frequency response curve you need to be following. If that, and on descriptions on left, which probably you all can have a look later on when this slides are available, just shows the different, a summary of the different things which you need to sort of adhere to to make this possible. And we've used this tool in that way to basically test two of those scenarios for low frequency and high frequency response. And you can see um, the curves here, similar to the previous ones. Um, you can see that this actually does follow them quite nicely for the low frequency ones. You can see the two, for example, and then the figure towards the right uh, shows um, the penalties you could get for under delivery and potential full penalties at different tiers and different, different things in terms of um, the state of charge rules that are specified in these ancillary services that um, could apply to a penalty and, and different other things which we factored in. And the diagram below also shows that similar response for high frequency DC. And uh, you can see the two starts to give a, a sort of an idea of how lets the users know how best um, the services could be applied in terms of collocating batteries with that as well. And this is just a rough idea of a summary of, of, of the things, so what the option of the message variables and the, the kind of the answers out of this too. It gives you a rough idea of the size of the battery, um, tells you about um, the capacity you need to store for that service as well. Um, tells you the, the capacity you need to tender for. It also gives you a kind of a footroom and headroom capacity you need to keep available within battery. 
And also we consider the situation where you could have an additional converter to transfer some of the power directly from the wind into the battery. And it gives you um, the evaluation of when that converter is actually viable or not. And you can see here in there, the MPVs are quite positive, which shows that these are actually a good financial investment for the wind farm under study. And this too, as I said, could be applied for any wind farm. So with your wind power profiles and even for battery manufacturers, if they do have data sets they need to, they want to model into it, we could actually add that in to give them some initial financial, initial financial insights to an in investment on battery wind farms. So that's just the summary and the end of my, my first presentation. And I think I have that second one on a, another slide. So I'll just quickly stop sharing and share the other one as well. Hey, thank you. In the meantime, uh, please, uh, this is uh, just a reminder to the panelists and the attendees. Uh, if you would like to make any questions, uh, if you can write them on the Q&A section so that we can start right after the presentation is over. Thank you. Okay. So I'm just trying to share the other one. Just let me know if, if that starts to show. We have the presentation, but it's not in presentation. Mode. Okay, so I'll just make that full screen now. So second presentation I'll just be talking about is another aspect, which is totally different from battery storage, which is around um, green hydrogen production. Um, so titled towards achieving net zero. And I'll just give in a sort of a high level overview. I know we've had a lot of discussions on this already, but I want to more or less focus on uh, the work we've done reports, which is around uh, solving the integration challenge reports, which you would see in the next couple of slides and summary of some of those sort of um, core research areas, which, which we saw that we, we probably need to be investigating to move towards how we can achieve net zero. Um, in, in different countries as well, but this is mostly focused on the UK's perspective of that from the catapult. So, so as we all know, as we've said in most of the other presentations, um, we have ambitious targets set up for 2050 to see how we could actually move towards cleaner generation of electricity. For example, in the UK, with the targets, um, we're moving for almost 40 gigawatts watts, and this could progress even further to about 75 to 100 gigawatts. Um, the electricity system is growing even so much bigger. You know, hydrogen production is kicking in. Low carbon heat is being um, installed in about 29 million homes. With this, a lot of um, talk and a lot of interest into zero carbon cars. That's also going into transportation and freights, and you know even things like changes to the diet as well to keep a clean um, sort of economy is part of the things that are moving there. So this drive towards um, net zero by 2050 is pushing a lot of um, research into different things as well. Um, in terms of the UK and in the current electricity generator mix as at 2018, this is what it looked like. There was a bit of coal generation there, but you can see as well as we're progressing further, that's totally changing. You know, offshore wind is really uh, playing a big role in the UK sector. And you can see this in, in the, the diagram on your right, there is no coal production, there is all mostly renewables. And this is what we sort of project, you know, the electricity generation mix could be in 2050 as well. So on the other side as well, like this has been talked about in previous presentation, but um, there is a huge demand for um, electricity or energy rather in, in the grids and not just the UK, but continental Europe as well. And there is sufficient option with available for the UK needs. And we, there's also even more than that available to export into the other regions as well. So the diagrams here just give different scenarios from different organizations like the base targets, uh, energy systems catapult as well, and different future energy scenarios as well as shows what sort of um, in terms of level like cost of energy, uh, how that could be varying between now and 2050 and in terms of how the growth in terms of the installed capacity in the UK um, in different scenarios as well. So I guess the summary is that um, option wind would be playing a big role and there's a potential to use that to meet those needs as well. 
So moving on to the aspects which really is interesting with um, green hydrogen. This is just a table which summarizes the different terminologies for hydrogen and based on the different set of vectors, as we probably all know, um, green usually refers to um, from renewable sources such as wind, solar, hydropower, and through electrolysis, through PEM or alkaline electrolyzers or other forms as well, and hardly has no, no emissions attached to that as well. Um, there's also, you know, based in terms of electricity, um, popular, some people will say pink hydrogen, which it comes from the nuclear electrical source. Um, other fossils, kind of based ones, the hydrogen, which has to do with the natural gas reformation and gray, brown, and black, which has to do with other aspects of how natural gas, brown, and black coal could be used um, through gasification to produce hydrogen as well. So a study be done um, over the last year by the Offshore Wind Industrial Council and Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult was to look to how we can um, solve the integration challenge of how offshore wind um, and hydrogen could be used in the future. Uh, this is just a summary of the key findings that came out of that. So part of things mentioned is the UK energy system requires about 130 terawatts hours what, to over 200 terawatts worth of hydrogen in 2050 to, uh, to integrate about 75 um, gigawatts or more of offshore wind. So that's a huge target which needs to be met. And you know that has to do with scaling of production from electrolyzers and scaling of also rapid R&D um, research into how this could be done as well. Um, also, uh, part with projections from some of the techno-economic analysis done by uh, our markets and insights team was that um, it's projected as well that green hydrogen should become more co cost competitive than blue hydrogen by 2050. And the diagram you can see on the right stuff gives you an idea around 20 before 2040. That's, that's a strike and balance. And afterwards, we expect that green hydrogen should be much, much cheaper than blue hydrogen as well. And the details of all this, you can have a look at the report, which is available online on the Orari Catapult's website as well. So part of the things, the key findings is, is also mentioned like how we need to actually move towards making this possible um, is to also drive the development of electrolyzers. Um, it reduces the cost. And there's a lot that has to do with the technology acceleration as well. Um, so the kind of the things we've talked about today from the different um, research topics would move towards um, accelerating this technology to make this possible. And not to forget as well that this huge potential benefit, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of the economy, in creation of jobs, and in creation of um, access to services to wider industries, which, which offshore wind at the moment do not um, sort of have any links to as well. So, this is just creates a huge market of potential benefits, which, which shows like the vast nature of hydrogen as a vast uh, energy source that can be any form of energy, any energy vector applicable as well. So the thinking here we didn't cut apart from the research team is green hydrogen mostly falls under these three areas around, first of all, the electrolyzer and the supporting sort of offshore, offshore infrastructure which has to do with things like the compressors, the desalination systems, and anything around the electrolyzer. Also, there are also things we could be doing with regards to um, the electrolyzer and improving its things like its balance, balance of plant efficiencies, its stack efficiencies, and how offshore wind in terms of the electricity produced could be utilized to make that a much more efficient, flexible uh, operation as well. Then there's a wider part which also cuts across not just onshore but offshore in terms of understanding how you know offshore wind is integrating into the wider energy system. So I think the previous slide from Omar really gives an insight into how you could probably distribute this offshore with vessels, but also you know we have talk about the pipelines, you know, onshore as well, which which has been mentioned as well in those presentations about how, you know, like with the electricity sort of networks, you're not able to get that down to areas where there is probably higher need for energy and how the existing pipelines and new pipelines can make that easier as well. So these are some of the innovation areas which, which um, green hydrogen covers as well. But to mention um, part of the things which link into that was this recommendations that came out from this report I mentioned 
which was a roadmap to how things should be done in terms of the progress thing. So as you can see, the first point here is the core reading program, which should focus on things like reducing the CapEx prices, should scale up the electrolyzers, should look, look at ways to improve efficiency, to increase reliability, to also make sure there's a bit of flexible operation in the systems, things like battery storage because you have a role to play within electrolyzers to keep the electrolyzers going, for example, when there isn't enough um, wind availability to produce hydrogen, and if there's a business case for that. So, and also how do you also the, support the supply chain in increasing the manuf manufacturability of that? And also things around the marine environment tolerance and also how you can foster new technologies that, that do electrolysis as well. Uh, for example, I've come across one that has no mem membranes and does it through cryogenics as well. So technologies like that, that might be at low terror levels or medium terror levels, how do you progress that to higher terror levels? Then as well, you, as we would expect, you should have demonstrations of skill with trial projects to test different aspects of this, be it from production to mobility to gas network industry. And as some people have touched today, there is a the huge question mark around the policies that we will need to be developed to make this progress further as well. So key questions I just put to you to kind of make everyone think about is that in that context of green hydrogen, there are things around we should think about, like what are the challenges? How do we improve the efficiency? How do we increase reliability? How do we create flexibility? And how do we supply, how do we support the supply and chain? And under those three elements of that, you know, we can either look at that from different aspects. So infrastructure, like the desalination systems, the compressor, aspects like the power electronics, you know, the comp subcomponents, the electrolyzers. And um, in terms of the integration, how do we, you know, improve wider integration of um, those systems as well? So finally, I'm just gonna run through quickly a number of projects we're working on. So one is um, in this area, one is Milford Haven and the part of Milford Haven somewhere in Cornwall in the UK, you know, we're working into understanding a bit about how do you develop um, major energy facility designs of offshore wind integrating into that community as well. So just at the, at the Celtic Sea there, um, there is a lot of huge interest of how the ports there could be used for some of these very um, net zero applications and the catapult is working with, you can see a host of people in trying to promote um, that in this area as well. There's another project which uh, we do, which focus more about the system architecture in terms of the controllers and that are needed to develop um, sort of a, a, a mixed energy system of gas and electricity in local energy communities. And that's the Clue project. And you can find more details about this in the website. And as well, we installing, we have at the Catapult have a demonstration turbine, a seven megawatt demonstration turbine. And there are plans to actually, um, which a project which is gonna be installing an electrolyzer there and that will be um, actually supporting 300 local homes in the Level Mount community. And that project will be the first of the kind to deploy direct supply of clean power of, of produced green hydrogen for, for domestic heating in that community as well. And these are just a, this is just a summary as well, um, which you can see in the slides maybe later on of the different sort of facilities we have in the catapult and sort of the a number of projects. So like the Southwest Industrial Cluster and ways we support the UK in driving this innovation as well. And I think that's just the summary and end of um, my presentation. And thank you very much. If any questions as well, we need to talk about them. Thank you. I, I will ask uh, both Omar and John to please uh, keep your videos on right now for the Q&A. Uh, Omar, if you don't mind, I will start with the questions for John since he has to leave soon. Uh, we yes. already, we already a couple of questions. Uh, one um, for John. The LCOE estimates presented are for which technology or group of technologies? So I guess the, 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 the LCOE is an analysis of certain configurations for green hydrogen production. Um, so one is onshore, the other is offshore as well. And either you connect that with electricity and or you do that basically with uh, the gas pipelines as well. So 
this was really done by the market analysis team, so which is not really so much of my area, but they did do a techno and economics feasibility study. So I think I'll mostly refer to that report and you would see uh, the details of exactly how that was done. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question uh, about the diet change that will be halved. The comparison has been done with the corresponding greenhouse gases produced to breed the animals or produce the products. If so, I think 50% of the greenhouse gases are produced due to animal breeding. This means that in terms of total greenhouse gases produced, they will reduce by 25% or more in this case. So I'm not too sure I fully understand the question. So the question around, this is around greenhouse gases. Uh, yes, um, I'm not sure if it's uh, related to one of your slides and how can the greenhouse gases can be reduced. Okay, so I'm not, this is not so much my area, I mostly focus on, on the electrical aspects, but um, I guess from option we would see the contribution of this sort of zero carbon emissions um, way of, of not having, using renewable energy sources to produce uh, hydrogen as, as a way to contribute towards, um, you know, contribute towards uh, lower carbon targets and, and everything in the UK. And because um, most of the electricity produced by offshore wind is, is going towards electricity, most of the electricity is going, is going towards the production from offshore wind. So there's a huge potential gap of, of hydrogen filling into that sphere as well. And that's where green hydrogen becomes a important topic in seeing how that could contribute towards the net, net sub zero ambitions of the UK as well. So in terms of in terms of animals and greenhouse, I'm not too sure what, what to say about that because I'm not sure that's really so much of my expertise but in terms of the electricity side of things and how that could support green hydrogen production, I think that contributes towards those targets. Okay, thank you. Um, do any of the panelists have any questions for John? Okay, I do have at least one. Uh, one regarding the tool that you presented, uh, is it uh, available for researchers to work with it and uh, make simulations or is the tool completely um, proprietary for Catapult and the University of Strathclyde? So, so the tool is actually available for anyone that's interested to, to use that as well. So um, at the moment, we're beginning to talk to certain stakeholders that we think might be interested in using that. So if it's anyone here that would like to know a bit more, um, I can put my details probably in, by email to you guys. Anyone can reach me and find out how to use that to, but it's open for um, what um, anyone else, anyone ready to use. So we see this, we've been doing this for a number of years. So to get it to this point, so and the idea is that we want to share this with everyone and see how we can develop it further in certain ways and use that for, to help people even based on consultancy work. Um, we're trying to work on a light version, which probably can be an executable file. I, that we could license out as well. So, but yeah, it's still under development, but yeah, it's the tool that's it's, it's coming on board soon within the Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I will keep moving on with the questions now. I think most of them are for Omar. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was really insightful and well explained in terms of investment, which is more viable from the three solutions, onshore, centralized offshore, or decentralized offshore? Is there a trade-off between them that makes it more viable as there is a DCAC power transport ca uh, with cables and distance? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. It's a really good question. Uh, I would say, uh, just like what you said, it's a trade-off, like there is no uh, one way to go. It really depends on the location and it depends on several aspects. But I can say that this location uh, fits best with onshore or that location fits best with centralized or decentralized. But uh, if we're talking from a distance perspective and having the cable uh, to the to the pipelines comparison, yes, there is uh, something to be said here, is that uh, the cables, uh, whether it's DC or AC, uh, the cost is per kilometer. So if there is a, a really large distance in principle, whether you want to go uh, like uh, it, it really has nothing to do with the, with the technology itself, whether, uh, I mean, like whether it's onshore or centralized or decentralized, uh, when the distance is really large, the hydrogen pipelines should be the way to go. And then you would have an offshore electrolysis 
from an economical point of view. Okay, so uh, for wind farms or yeah, technologies that are very far away from shore, you would recommend pipeline when they're close to shore, you would recommend cable, okay? Correct. Um, one more question, a couple of more questions. Thank you for a presentation, very interesting. Vessels, uh, vessel options is expensive, but saves electrical substation and export cables, about 20 to 30% current offshore wind farm costs. Are you going to analyze it? Why not to produce also ammonia in the vessel and transport it instead of hydrogen? Yeah, that's actually another good question. Uh, the vessel is uh, is an expensive option, uh, but in comparison with the electric substation, yes, of course, uh, because uh, the the substation takes uh, yeah a huge percentage of the offshore wind farm. But I said the vessel is expensive in comparison with the decentralized concept because the decentralized concept doesn't have to have uh, uh, an extra uh, foundation to have the electrolysis facility. So uh, if you're comparing the centralized with their own shore, that's valid. But if you're comparing the centralized to the decentralized, uh, no, the decentralized would be more economical. And if I'm going to analyze it, uh, uh, at the end of the day, I'm doing a PhD, so like I won't be able to tackle everything, but uh, I decided to go the decentralized for how further research questions it has. And uh, talking about the ammonia and uh, producing ammonia in the vessel, pretty much valid. Uh, and that's actually the way to go in a lot, a lot of projects. I'm working this. Uh, I'm working on this aside, uh, but like I'm a, as as an, a co-author. That's not my main publication. But producing ammonia and using it for ships is definitely uh, the way to go in a lot of uh, of things. But I'm, I'm I'm focused in the hydrogen at the moment and how to get the green hydrogen. The, uh, like the, to go with the cost reduction as much as I can. Okay, we have uh, one more question. Uh, have you considered using a hydrocell for backup power generation instead of batteries? Interesting, very interesting. In the beginning, in the very beginning, when I, when I started doing uh, this PhD, the fuel cells were, were one, uh, was one of the options for the backup power. However, it's a really complex system to have integrated on the floating deck, if I'm talking about uh, the decentralized system, that's one point. The second point is that uh, that's not that much of electricity needed. And anyway, you would have to have uh, several uh, maintenance visits to the, to the, to the turbine. So uh, this is complex to, to keep it uh, like, uh, like from an operation and maintenance perspective. So the battery is less complex and it would do the job. You don't need to go way that complex. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question, but uh, it was for John and uh, he's not available anymore. So we will send, uh, send it to him by email. Uh, right now, we will move to the last presentation, which was from the hydrodynamic session yesterday and, and wasn't available to, available to present. Uh, our next speaker is Rasi Jalal Abadi from University College London. And her presentation is on large eddy simulation of open channel flow over square bars at different renal numbers. Welcome. Um, hello, I am Razia and uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, first, I want to apologize for not being able to present at the time slot which was allocated to me yesterday. I had a meeting and I also didn't pay attention to the time difference. So my theme, uh, the theme of my presentation is going to be a little different with the theme of other presentations, but I hope this will be helpful for everyone here. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, is everybody able to... Uh... No, it's perfect. Okay, yes. Uh, yes, I'm Razia and I'm a research fellow in University College London and I'm going to present some of my results, uh, some of my re recent results from um, the research I'm doing entitled as large edge simulation of open channel flow over square bars at different Reynolds number. Uh, the, the motivation for doing um, this research is that uh, we want to study the flow in the rivers. And uh, the flow in the rivers, in, in, uh, like uh, considering the geometry, is quite similar to the open channel flow. And uh, the other thing that we recently have got to know is that um, we know that the disturbances or the water surface features in the rivers are correlated with the flow, the bulk of the flow inside uh, 
the um, bulk, and then uh, it's also correlated with the uh, roughness at the bed. So uh, if we do a numerical simulation, we can have different variables like pressure and velocity at all the grid points. Uh, and then we can study the interaction between the bed, the bulk of the fluid and the water surface. Uh, in order to choose the roughness types, we chose the bar. Uh, even though the bars might seem very simple, but it has this geometry has been studied, has been used to study the uh, flow over rough beds uh, in both open and closed channel flows and in the supplement boundary layers, as they are helpful for better understanding of the interaction of the roughness and the bulk of the fluid. So uh, the simulations um, has been done uh, using uh, an in-house co code, and I obviously use some. Uh, I obviously use the uh, governing equations, which are known, known as the Navier-Stokes equations, and I also use the large eddy simulation approach, in which we do the spatial filtering. So we are going to only um, in simulate the large eddies, and the smaller eddies are going to be modeled. This process helps us to uh, have uh, to reduce the computational cost. Uh, the in-house code which has been used uh, has, is a Hydro 3D, is named as Hydro 3D, in which the fractional step method is used to decouple the pressure and velocity. And then we use the rang um, uh, scheme and also the second order center difference scheme for uh, discretization of the equations. Uh, in order to track the uh, free surface, um, I use the level set method, which is a method to capture the free surface. In this method, we use a convection equation for a parameter or a variable known as phi and uh, at every time step. And phi is um, like we use phi uh, to detect the uh, or to capture the free surface. When we have the negative value for phi, there is the air. And when we have the positive value, we have the water. So phi equal to zero represents the free surface. I'm not going to uh, discuss deeply the numerical uh, approach I have used, and I'm going to focus more on the results which have been generated. In the first step, I just used the um, In the first step, I just used um, uh, the, uh, the, the generated results to validate them. Uh, the first thing is about the geometry. I used two geometries for two different bar spacings, as can be seen in these two figures I'm showing you right now. Uh, in the smaller bar spacing, um, the smaller bar, spa bar spacing is known as a transitional roughness. This is a name attributed to this bar spacing. And then the next one, the larger bar spacing is known as the K-type roughness. Um, the differences are be, um, the different names are given to them because of different features of the recirculation area we are going to see uh, later on. Um, uh, but what I did was that I simulated these two cases for three different Reynolds number for the turbulent laminar and transitional flow. And for turbulent flow, in order to be sure about the domain size I have chosen and about the grid resolution I have chosen, I did two more simulations. Uh, one of them with the finer grid, in which I increased the number of the grid in both streamwise and spanwise and wall normal directions. And the other one in the double do, double size domain, where in which I increased the size of the domain, uh, I made it twice in the streamwise and spanwise direction. And then I validated the results. Um, the free surface elevation and the streamwise velocity uh, with the benchmark which is available here. I have shown here the free surface elevation and uh, along with uh, similar results from LES and experimental results from the benchmark. And as we've seen here, there is a really good agreement between my results and the benchmark. The first, um, <clears throat> the first parameter I um, looked at was the free surface elevation. What we see here is that um, for the flow over bars with smaller spacing, there is not too much of the variations over the free surface. But for larger bar spacing, we have a standing width, uh, which is kind of a jump at the free surface, uh, which is the main feature of uh, free surface in this case. The other important point here is that uh, we do not have that much of the differences in the water surface elevation when we increase the Reynolds number from laminar to turbulent flow. 
But for the flow over bars with larger spacing, uh, we can see that there is a noticeable change in this in the uh, free surface elevation around the uh, jump height uh, around, around the standing wave near the free surface when we increase the uh, Reynolds number. This is for the mean water surface elevation. But looking at the instantaneous water surface elevation, we see that increasing uh, the Reynolds number, we do not really see uh, any changes in the main features of the free surface, but the disturbances or the wrinkles that you can see here are increased by increasing the Reynolds number. The next important parameter is the streamwise velocity. Uh, the average uh, or mean streamwise velocity, which has been shown here. As you can see, the recirculation area, which is the area where we have the negative streamwise velocity, is uh, has different shapes in both uh, cases for both geometries. In the bar spacings, in the smaller bar spacings, this recirculation area occupies all the troughs between the bars. But in the bar space, in the larger bar spacing, this recirculation area extends to some certain point in the streamwise direction, and then, which is known as the reattachment point, and then the boundary layer is recovered after this recirculation zone, or after the, the reattachment point. The other, not, uh, the other uh, important result we see here is that um, the reattachment point, uh, we have the um, largest area, the largest area for the extension of the recirculation zone, or, uh, sorry, for the siren. And um, yes, and the largest uh, extension for the recirculation zone is, uh, corresponds to the transitional uh, regime. Uh, the reason is that in the laminar regime, we have the largest uh, stresses which uh, forces the flow to attach to the bed sooner and pushes the reattachment point back to the bar in the, uh, in the upstream. The same process happens uh, in the turbulent uh, flow condition, but due to another reason, due to the larger disturbances. So these disturbances push back the reattachment point towards the bar. And then we have so we have the largest uh, extension for uh, re uh, for um, recirculation zone in the transitional regime. The other important parameter we studied here is the fruit number at the water surface or at the free surface. Fruit number is directly related to the streamwise velocity. Uh, so uh, what we see here is that uh, for the flow over bars with smaller spacing, the fruit number does not really change uh, drastically over the water surface or the free surface. But there is uh, an increase uh, at the upstream of the standing wave in this geometry for the fruit number, and then a sudden decrease in the fruit number after the standing wave. The reason here is that we have an increase in the uh, streamwise velocity at the upstream of the standing wave. And then there is a reduction in the streamwise velocity because we have larger cross section available here because we do not have the recirculation zone and we also have a jump uh, or increase in the water surface elevation. So we have larger cross section and in order to keep the constant mass flow rate, we have smaller streamwise velocity. So larger streamwise velocity at the upstream of standing wave smaller streamwise velocity at the downstream of standing wave. All these things leads to the increase of the fruit number and decrease of it at the upstream and downstream of standing wave respect, respectively. The other important prom parameter I studied uh, was the wall normal velocity, the mean wall normal velocity. What we see here is that there is a large interaction between the bed and the water surface uh, when we have larger bar spacing. Uh, so we can see that this interaction, this interaction, this interaction in terms of the wall mean wall normal velocity, there is kind of a mild interaction, a similar interaction between the bed and the water surface for laminar flow uh, in this geometry, but uh, this interaction just decreases when uh, we increase the Reynolds number. Uh, the other parameters are the pressure and friction factors studied for this geometry. Uh, when we look at the pressure factor uh, or the pressure coefficient, we see that the pressure coefficient is larger for the flow over larger bar spacing. And the reason is that 
uh, as we saw in the previous figures shown in the previous slide, um, we know that the pressure are the perpendicular forces to the bed. We have larger perpendicular forces to the bed exerted on the bed, on the bed uh, for the flow over bars with larger spacing. And the reason is the interaction of the bed and the water surface, because we have smaller interaction between the bed and the water surface. So CP or the pressure coefficient is smaller in this case, but larger in this case. So the, this is one of the effects of the interaction of the bed with the water surface. The other, the other parameter is friction factor. And what we see, well, we obviously expected to have the smallest friction factor for turbulent cases. But again, in order to have smaller recirculation uh, zone and then the reattachment uh, of the flow to the bed, we have some large positive friction factor generated after this recirculation zone. And then this leads to the increase in the value of the friction coefficient for flow over bars, over larger bar spacing. But there is one main uh, different feature um, uh, which occurs uh, or which corresponds to the flow over roughnesses. And that is that we have a new type of fluctuation, which is known as special fluctuations. When we have the turbulent flow uh, over smooth beds, we decompose any instantaneous variable like the velocity or the pressure to its time averaged value and its fluctuations or temporal fluctuations. These temporal fluctuations are the deviations from the time averaged variables. But when we have the roughnesses, we not only have the temporal fluctuation, we have spatial fluctuation. The reason is that we apply a double averaging and a double averaging means averaging of any variable in time and in space. So we have, we can be decomposed any instantaneous variable to its double average value, its temporal variations, um, its temporal fluctuations and its spatial fluctuations. And the spatial fluctuations are generally known as the dispersive components, and they represent the spatial variations from the time from the time averaged uh, quantities. So, in order to do the double averaging and calculate the double averaged variables, we uh, need to just uh, choose an averaging volume. The averaging volume should generally be parallel to the bed and it should, its size should be larger than the roughness length scales, which is, for example, the roughness height and the roughness distances. So what I have chose for my geometry is uh, this uh, thin slab, as can, you can see in this figure, and then uh, its extension in the span wise direction is equal to the span by size of the domain, and its extension to the stream wise direction is also streamwise uh, extension of the domain because my domain site is just um, between these two uh, lines as I'm showing right now. And I have the periodic boundary condition. So uh, in order to see how important is uh, the uh, dispersive components, I just tried first to look at their contribution uh, for the generation of the friction coefficient, which is one important force and one important uh, coefficient we look. Um, so I just used an approach which has been proposed in by Nicora et al. Uh, in 2019. And then I calculated the contribution of different stresses uh, for the generation of friction coefficient. What we can see here, which are the viscous contribution, Reynolds shear stress contribution, and dispersive shear stress contribution. What we can see here is that the dispersive contributions are not really negligible or small. And also by increasing the bars, the roughness spacing or the bar spacing, their contribution increases. So their contribution is not really small and negligible. And it is really better to consider, it is like really helpful to consider them in our uh, simulation and in our investigations for the flow over offices. The other um, approaches, the other parameters or variables I have or variables I have studied are the kinetic energy and the fluctuations, the velocity fluctuations. For example, we see here that uh, TKE is actually calculated using the fluctuations, but WKE is the kinetic energy generated by spatial fluctuations calculated as shown here. So what we see here is that WKE is smaller than TKE as we expected, 
but increasing the bar spacing, the WJE also increases, which means that the kinetic energy, which is which corresponds to the spatial fluctuations, increases by increasing the roughness uh, spacing uh, for the bars for this specific type of roughness. Also, we we can see here that uh, the, for example, the streamwise. Um, component for spatial fluctuations is not really small. So it's better to consider it in our analysis. And also uh, here we can, we can see that U tilde, which is a spatial fluctuations of streamwise velocity are not small. Um, we, can, we can as well see that the Reynolds shear, the shear stresses, both the Reynolds shear and the dispersive shear are not really negligible. So all in all, the message here is that uh, when we have the roughness, uh, we have, I mean, it, it's better, it is more helpful to do the double averaging technique in order to use the double average averaging technique uh, to have the, to be able to calculate dispersive components as the dispersive components and their contribution to different uh, parameters like the friction coefficient are not really small. This helps us to be able to study the friction coefficient or other parameters and their distribution or their generation in the uh, flow over roughnesses better. Uh, so in order to summarize and mention some concluding remar remarks, I can say that uh, using my simulation, I got, I just, uh, I got to know that um, in, or in terms of the mean water surface elevations, for transition uh, roughnesses, which is the smaller roughnesses we can see here, there is uh, not so much differences in the water surface elevation or no specific uh, event happening at the water surface. But increasing the um, roughnesses, the bar roughnesses, we can see that there is a, a standing wave as a specific feature of the uh, water surface. When we look at the instantaneous water surface, there is not too much differences for different Reynolds number, except that for higher Reynolds number, we have larger disturbances. Uh, fruit number, which is a number representing re explicitly related to the streamwise velocity. Uh, this uh, is almost constant at the free surface for a smaller bar spacing, but it has an increase and a decrease just at upstream and downstream of the standing wave for the flow over larger bar spacing. The standing wave uh, also, um, the standing wave also induces the interaction of the bed with the free surface. So uh, we, can, we could see that in the variations of the wall normal velocity, which shows us the interaction between the bed and the water surface or the free surface. And in the end, I studied the increasing, I studied the um, dispersive components, which are related to and represent the spatial variations of any variable. And this, we, have, we only have these parameters or variables for uh, rough, uh, roughness surfaces, for rough surfaces, not for smooth surfaces. And uh, I also showed that increasing the bar spacing, the contribution of the, these dispersive components for the generation of the friction coefficient increases. Uh, this is all. And if there's any question, I would like to um, hear that and answer that. Thank you, Rati. Um, if you don't mind, please turn, uh, keep on your video. And right now, uh, we don't have any questions yet from the attendees. Do any of the panelists have any questions? Um, hey, yes, I do have some questions uh, for school. Um, firstly, I see that you're doing an LES and uh, you have a, a, a rough surface at the bottom. So, and I see that the values is, that you showed for Y plus, I don't know, was Y plus your uh, wall normal in this case, or was that Z plus? Z plus is, is the wall normal direction. Right, and what values, uh, could you show me the, the Z plus values that you uh, in the table that you had? Uh, uh, yes. Yes, uh, so my first question is, uh, usually when you have a solid body and you have a wall normal direction, you, and you're doing LES, you try to go for a, Y plus or Z plus in this case of, of one or, or, or less than five. Um, I, in your case, is it not so important because of some specific reason? Uh, 
Uh, the point is that yes, yeah, I, I understand it. Uh, it was a question asked by another person in some other presentations too. The point is that these delta x plus, delta y, delta y plus, and delta z plus are calculated using Utah, which has been calculated using DPDX, the pressure gradient. So when I recalculated them using the average shear stress, while shear stress, then uh, it, my delta Z plus is exactly less than two, as you mentioned. So um, I should just change these uh, in this table to the new ones, not to raise any question. Yes, because I mean, uh, when you say LES, there is this uh, concept that, okay, if you have an LES and if it is this large, then uh, will you be able to capture the turbulence scale? So that's, that's good to know. Um, another question I also had, if, if there are no other questions is, uh, so I see that you've chosen two different spacings for the bars. Uh, is there any specific reason that you chose this? And do you also plan to do any kind of parametric study on, on how this distance varies and at which point you start getting this curve that you were showing for the larger distance? Well, the reason that I have shown these two spacing, well, you most probably know that we have different uh, roughness types, which are the D type, transitional, and then the K type roughness type, get the K type. Uh, so uh, for the D type, this, uh, the, this spacing this spacing is very smaller and then if we decrease it we can have something like the super hydrophobic surfaces we didn't want to go to that uh, concept of the super hydrophobic surfaces but if we chose the d type then we had the recirculation area uh, just uh, occupying the troughs between two bars so it this the i mean in terms of the recirculation area that would not be um, very like different with the transitional roughness we have chosen here. So we just decided to choose a one case for the transitional roughness and one case for the K-type roughness. And the other thing is that the other reason is that we intend to uh, study uh, the flow rivers in the end, at the end of this project. So in the rivers, um, it's mainly like uh, these types of the roughnesses, uh, which, have, which are seen. The D-type roughness is not very much um, observed uh, in the river flows, as I know. I see. Um, uh, just a follow-up question. So uh, as you can see, so here you have 5.2 lambda k and 10.4. Uh, Do you know at which value of lambda k, I don't know, 6, 7, does this effect of having the a smooth free surface and, and a bumpy free surface, uh, do you know at which point this transition occurs? Have you have you studied it maybe or are you interested no, in no, looking I at it? No, I didn't study that, no. I didn't study the strict, very exact uh, lambda over k where the transition happens, no. Okay, great. Um, uh, Amarina, I, I mean, if there are any more questions, I can I can stop here. Otherwise, I, I'm happy to continue because hydrodynamics is anyways my field as well. No, right now we don't have any more questions. Uh, if you have anything more, uh, go ahead. Or if not, we just yeah. we can close the session for today. Uh, just one last question then. Uh, sure. Um, regarding the, the decomposition of the velocity that you showed, where you're splitting it into the, the time average, the uh, time fluctuations, and the spatial fluctuations, um, I, I'm just trying to correlate it. So generally, as you know, like for, for example, in the smooth case, you said uh, it splits into the time average and you have the, the, the time fluctuations. So when we, if we do a rough simulation and, and we split the velocity into, of course, the mean kinetic energy and the turbulent kinetic energy, in which part would the spatial fluctuations fall into if you don't do a split for the spatial as well? Uh, I'm just trying to, uh, it's, it's more of a conceptual question really, but uh, I just uh, wondered. Um, so you mean that when I do, one thing I can say is that, um, uh, when you uh, split, when you want to study the flow over roughnesses, you can still keep this approach. You can still right. have the time average and the temporal fluctuation. But if you just try to use the double average technique, which is the both time and spatial average, then utilna appears here. And the double average technique has recently, in the past, uh, like decades has been used a lot because uh, it gives a better understanding of the flow features over the roughnesses. But uh, I don't think I answered your question. So may I ask you to please repeat your question? Uh, no, my, my just question was that when you do only a time average, uh, then is the spatial fluctuations then contained in the time average fluctuation term or is it in the mean term? Like where the would it? Term. 
in the mean, okay. Yes, as okay. you can see, maybe I just need to uh, like change these two terms because if you compare these two instantaneous flow field, to, so the temporal is equal to the summation of double average and dispersive component. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, that answered my questions. And with that, I'm, uh, I'm done for my questions. Thank you, Marina. And so, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you very much. If there is no question, can I just stop sharing my screen or if there's any other question, I'm still here. No, yes, please stop sharing the screen. And I would like to thank all the speakers today and all the attendees as well. Uh, with these, we end the session and hope to see you tomorrow. Great. Thank you, thank Marina. You very much. Thank you all for attending.